Thanks for downloading Children's Peedcast. I'm Jimmy Bellamy, and this week my guest is Annie Waters, the Director of Annual Giving in the Foundation at Children's Hospitals and Clinics of Minnesota. It's November, it's giving season, and we have Give to the Max Day coming up on November 12th. And we are also going to be, um, as the weeks go on here, uh, sharing with you a lot of our uh, giving campaign related items. So look forward to seeing that. Annie and I sat down and got to talk about the foundation's signature events, uh, giving in general, giving to children, the ways you can give, as well as uh, some other donor related items. It was a fun conversation. I, I enjoy working with Annie and, and talking with her, so it was great to get an hour of her time to share all of this with you guys. We recorded it a few weeks ago, and at the time, we had yet to run the Twin Cities Marathon. I was a member of Team Superstars for that, and we raised money for Children's. At the time, I had only raised 40% of my goal. I'm happy to report that I increased it to beyond 100% of my goal, so... I was thrilled to do that, to be able to raise money for the hospital. And uh, on a much secondary level, I, I finished the marathon and was uh, extremely happy with uh, how that race went. So uh, all is well there. So I won't leave you in suspense when you hear it later on in the show. Um, enjoy this show and uh, check us out on Twitter, at Children's MN. We're on the web at childrensmn.org. And then we also launched a microsite in conjunction with our brand launch, which we will get to tell you about in the next episode of the podcast. But check us out there at amazingis.org, and you'll find some cool stories about patients and uh, some other amazing kids. And then uh, you can check us out on Facebook, uh, on iTunes, where everywhere a podcast can be found, including Stitcher, Podbean, and we're even up on Vimeo and YouTube. Those are audio only, but you can still check us out there. So enjoy this episode with Annie Waters. Where's your family live? Um, I grew up in Wheaton, Illinois, which okay. is a suburb of Chicago. I'm familiar with it. I've never been um, there. Though. Yep. It's about 20 miles west of Chicago, and my parents still live there. My siblings and their families live mm-hmm. there. So um, I'm the one who got away. Okay. What got What got you to Minnesota? I went to St. Olaf. Yeah? Yeah. What, <laughs> what, appealed, what appealed to you? Because I, when I went to high school, I... I knew I wanted to go to college, but I didn't know what for. Yeah. So I took a year off. Oh, good for you. I, I didn't look at schools. I didn't apply for scholarships. Yeah. It was probably a mistake not doing that. No. I was an admissions counselor as my first career, and I would say to a lot of parents that I wish more particularly like teenage boys did that mm-hmm. because I think you need to know what you want to do or you're going to – or you have to at least be mature enough to like kind of know how college works Yeah. or you end up dropping out. Or not, you know, I knew I wanted to go to a liberal arts college. Like I knew I wanted to go to a small liberal, like I knew I wanted to be an English major. Mm -hmm. I didn't totally know what I wanted to do with it. Um, And I knew I wanted to ideally not be in Illinois was kind of like I wanted to go away. But so I looked a lot of places um, and realized the further away I went, I was like, I don't want to really be that far away. And Minnesota, even though I had never (laughs) been there before, seemed like, gosh, there's all these like small liberal arts colleges. And I really thought I was going to go to McAllister. Like everything I read about it, I was like, this is my school. And I got there and I was like, this is like in the middle of a city. And growing up in like a suburban area, I kind of wanted, and there's a, a college in the town I grew up in, it's called Wheaton College. And it's like this cute kind of idyllic like the campus Mm -hmm. is kind of in its own space so when we were visiting McAllister my mom was like well why don't we drive down to Northfield because we knew someone at Carleton and so we went to Carleton and that wasn't really my thing and then the woman at Carleton was like you should go to St. Olaf and check it out and I just like fell in love what was what was it about St. Olaf that made you it was like a weirdo well, it was like it's you know Northfield's kind of rural, mm-hmm. and like the college is up on the hill, and it's like all the buildings are limestone. I mean, this is like literally how I was deciding, 
and it was just like what I envisioned college was supposed to be. And then the people were like so friendly. I walked around campus with another person who I was like an acquaintance from Wheaton who was going to St. Olaf and everyone was like hey Allie like everyone knew her and she just was like I love it here and so um, I almost like then went home and had to do the research to be like is this really a good college you know Mm -hmm. is this the right college for me and it it, um, you know fit like my academic credentials pretty well so I applied and when I got in I was like that's where I'm going yeah never looked back so Tell me about, because I'm from here, and, and when it came to, for me, when it came to choosing school for me, growing up, I always envisioned going to a school like Florida State, mm. and, and that's only because of seeing big-time college athletics sure. on TV, yep. and I thought, it's going to be a big D1 school, yeah. and I'm going to be involved in stuff, yeah. and then I ended up just going to UMD in yeah. Duluth, where I was yeah. from. I love UMD. Right. I you know, was I've been a fan of the school my entire life. It was a great experience there. Four years, got my degree done. Nice. And it was it was great. It was fine, but it was nothing like I had envisioned right. as a kid. I see, and I never I I'm not a sports fan, so like I never really was into. And my parents went to a really small, like kind of random college in mm-hmm. Michigan, so I never really thought um, a lot about like big. My sister went to Notre Dame, and my grandpa went to Notre Dame, so that was like the in my mind, like the school that so, maybe. So your family's ashamed of you? No, I think like <laughs> actually it's kidding. kind of the other way around. Like my mm-hmm. family's all like, to, and you're my ashamed, sis- you're ashamed my of your sister's family? not really like a Notre Dame person. Mm-hmm. Like she's not one of those obnoxious like, oh, Notre Dame. But um, I remember going to visit her. She's only a year older than me and just being like, this isn't a right place for me because mm-hmm. it just wasn't my style you know like she took me to a football game and we had to stand up the whole time and I'm just like this is ridiculous I don't want to like this is just not me um beautiful place and like you know whatever but great educational Mm -hmm. system so I don't know that I would have been smart enough to get in there either at the time I don't know would you be smart enough now I don't know actually sometimes I wonder if I've gotten dumber in my old age (laughs) well I think about when I was in school I, if you if you pressed me right now to name five classes I took in college, yeah. I would have a hard time coming up with the names of the classes. Yeah. I don't even want to begin to talk about remembering the actual right. curriculum. content. Yes, but I'm from here. Yep. Do you feel like you're from Minnesota? Do you have Do you have a battle internally about Illinois, What's Minnesota? Home? I mean, I'll definitely say sometimes like I'm going home Mm -hmm. when I'm going to visit my family and I go there quite a bit, actually. Um, But then similarly, when I'm there, I'll be like, oh, I'm heading home tomorrow, meaning here. I will tell you um, my like social cohort in Minnesota is almost all transplanted people. Like I have a lot of friends from North Dakota. I have a lot of friends from Chicago. Um Iowa um and I think Minnesota is a little bit of a hard space to crack into if you're not we are not nice to quote unquote outsiders (laughs) we are not um and you know I went to college here so it's like you still kind of are you're creating a lot Mm -hmm. of like community through that um but I don't actually think I have a friend who grew I have one friend who is like a college friend who we've stayed you know close who grew up here and otherwise two friends I should say otherwise almost everyone's like from somewhere else and so we've kind of created a little community based on that but I think we all consider this like our home Mm -hmm. I mean I think we're very like proud Minnesotans but I don't know do you do you feel like you're doing right now what you had set out to do when you got into college or when you graduated college you said you started in admissions yes um I had no idea what I was going to do. I mean, I probably thought like, I'm going to work in like advertising or PR Mm -hmm. or like, but did I even really know what that meant? I don't know. I still don't. Um, Yeah. And then I, so I went to college. I studied English. I took lots of like pretty crazy. I mean, I was like the person who was like 
mom, dad, I'm taking Norwegian. And they were like, why? And I'm like, because the school is like all about Norwegians. And like, it sounds so fun. And, you know, I was kind of like taking classes more because I thought they were cool and interesting than like, this is going to help me get a career. Mm -hmm. I kind of just think I took for granted that like a career will come along. And so when I was a senior, I was like doing, um, I had interned the ELCA, which is like the head of the Lutheran Church, like the umbrella of the Lutheran Church, has like a headquarters in Chicago. And I got like an internship there Mm -hmm. doing like really lame database, like data entry type stuff. But it was like in their marketing department. And so I'm I applied for some jobs. I applied for like sales jobs. I remember being just like none of this sounded very exciting. And I had been a student worker in the admissions office. And um, the director was like, why don't you apply? We have an opening for an admissions counselor. And I was like, that sounds great. You know, like you're young. You get to like travel. Uh, you are you get to like talk about something that you're passionate about. And so I did that for a few years. And it was really good training for the work that I do now. Um, especially because my next job after admissions was actually – doing fundraising for the college Mm -hmm. um and so like you learn to talk about value I mean you're having to like ask these families to pay thirty thousand dollars for their kids education you kind of got to be able to like sell it in a way that's like authentic and values based and um so it was a it was a super fun job right out of college spent a ton of time away like was always traveling um and it just became like a hard job like Mm -hmm. it just started to feel like gosh this is hard so I was able to get the opportunity to um learn more about development work at the college um where I was doing the admissions work which was also St. Olaf so this whole time I've never left my alma mater Mm -hmm. and we um I learned about annual fund work and I was like this is very similar type work um but with like a little bit different constituency alumni donors Um, And so I said, I'd love to be part of that team. Luckily, they took me on. I learned a ton, uh, spent quite a few years doing that. And then um, Teresa Pesch came knocking at my door when our uh, campaign kicked off. And she said, I really need someone to start an annual fund at Children's. And are you interested? And I was not like thinking about leaving but it sounded really exciting because one children's didn't really have an annual fund to speak of at the time there was some events that were in place um, but they weren't really raising just money from everyday individuals who wanted to support children's and so uh, she invited me to consider joining the team they had just announced that they would be expanding and renovating the two hospital campuses they were going to be raising just a ton of money and I thought this sounds really like hard work but fun work and um with a mission that's pretty hard to beat because it's kids and it's making sure they're healthy and it's taking care of them and their families so eight years later I'm still here (laughs) that's what I tell people anytime people ask me about whether it be specifically about my job or just, hey, how's your job going? I mean, it's been a year and a half since I've been here, so it's not new, new. But right. to some people, I, I maybe have only seen them once right. since I moved. And I'll say it's great because everyone here shares the passion for helping kids. Mm-hmm. Working in newspapers, people work in newspapers for a variety yep. of reasons. Even in a newsroom, people are there for a different reason. And... It was cool that coming on to a team of 16 people, yep. just using my department as the example, everyone was passionate about helping kids. Yep. They were enthusiastic, and I think they're all pretty darn good right. at their jobs. Yep. So that made it cool to come here and then to see the other departments the same yeah. thing. Yep. And when it's come to fundraising, being around for the Q4 campaign last year, yeah. same thing where you can say – here's what your money is going toward Mm -hmm. and you can physically show them look open your eyes this is what it goes to instead of hey give us money right we promise you it's going to a good (laughs) cause just trust us right that has to make it a little easier than say working for a a place where your money is going to somewhere where the donors aren't quite sure if that's really what it's going to yeah well that's actually one of the things i like 
a lot about working in at Children's and in the annual fund at Children's because a lot of nonprofits have, you know, this kind of um, fund where they ask donors who give, you know, under $10,000, they might say, please direct your funds to this area. And it's a little bit viewed as kind of... Um, Sometimes people think of it as a black hole. Like, what am I really supporting? Am I supporting the cause or the operations? And at Children's, we do a really great job of letting donors, whether they're giving $5 or whether they're giving $5 million, make the choice of where they want their gifts to go. Uh, A lot of our donors are still choosing to say, I trust you, Children's, to put this money where it's needed the most. But we are seeing more and more people saying, I really care about cancer or I really care about diabetes or um, our cardiovascular program and I want my donation to go there. And no matter what the size of that donation, we absolutely are going to put it to use in the area that you want it. And that is a little bit unusual. A lot of nonprofits really want their kind of urgent needs money to be not earmarked and as unrestricted as possible. And I think we do a good job at Children's of really honoring the donor's intent for their money. I do think we also do a really good job of communicating impact because we are committed to show people that we're not only thankful for their gift, but that it does make a difference. And um, we, you know, try to communicate that throughout the year in a variety of ways um, through storytelling through facts and figures, um, through real life examples. We love to bring people in for tours so that they can see their philanthropic contributions at work, if you will, or uh, sometimes we bring people in for tours ahead of time to see what they could, you know, dream about Mm -hmm. with their philanthropic dollar. And so um, that piece of kind of stewardship and gratitude and impact reporting is a really important part of my work and I would argue just as important as the asking for money piece because you really can't continue to ask for money if you're not saying thank you a lot as well. Tell me about the transformation that has taken place in eight years here. It's just through photos I've seen some of the construction. Um, So physically the transformation then and also just how children's has evolved whether it be even in the foundation alone how you've constantly had to change uh how people are giving how we're asking people to give i mean this it's a broad question yeah i mean absolutely look at how technology has played a role <laughs> in everything Yes, there's absolutely been a lot of physical transformation which is really fun i feel really really lucky that i got on board. I actually, one of my first days at Children's was the groundbreaking in St. Paul. Um, so have been really able to witness the change firsthand physically. The other kind of unexpected outcome of that physical change is I think the way that our employees and um, providers and even patient families respond to how they think and act and feel about gifts to children. When I first started, you know, you would bring a donor through a clinical unit and people would be a little suspicious and they would wonder, what are you doing up here and why are you here? And um, the more and more we saw these physical changes, the more and more I saw people open up to the idea of, gosh, philanthropy can make such a big difference to my physical space or my program space. And so we started really um, being able to partner differently with our clinical teams, partner differently with our families, and really give our donors a great experience when they come through the doors to see what we're doing here. And we know that 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 is so important to donors to actually get to see firsthand how they could make a difference. So that was kind of one part of the change. I think the other big change in my world was Um, when Teresa hired me in 2008, I was a team of one. I was brought in to start building a program. I am now fortunate to be able to work with, um, 11 other individuals who are raising, uh, $6 million specifically through events and 
um, annual giving work. And so uh, we are really the ground game of children's. Most of our gifts, 80% of gifts um, in that $6 million or in the $32 million comes from people giving $25 to $999. So um, we're raising money through kind of bits and pieces along the way. And it's it's been a lot of fun to see that team grow. And of course, as your human resources grow, you're able to do more and more things out in the community. So we're doing fun things um, with events. We have seven signature events that really uh, meet donors at kind of all different places where they are, everything from our big fancy star gala um, to our family friendly events like Heartbeat and Baby Steps, where they're a little more accessible. Families can bring their friends out and we can all do something fun like run or walk for a good cause. Um, the team works really closely with a lot of donors in the community to engage them on what makes a difference for the their philanthropy for their family's philanthropy and um you know whether that's a ten thousand dollar circle of care donor who's thinking about naming a private patient room after themselves or um a girl scout troop who has done a penny drive for us and wants to contribute the uh, earnings from that to make a difference for kids we're really meeting a variety of donors in a lot of places so That's, lots of lots of stuff going on always <laughs> related to transformation too how have you seen outside of these walls the number of allies build yeah and change that's actually an awesome question um we have been able to double the number of donors over the past eight years to children's, which is really an amazing testament to how the community wants to engage with us. And these are donors, again, from young families to um, pretty significant philanthropists. We've also been able to partner with some pretty fun um, Minnesota companies. Uh, Best Buy is a great example uh, in Early in my career, some families from Best Buy who had had significant significant experiences at Children's said, we need to um, rally around Children's as a place. And uh, through a variety of people coming together, our Geek Squad was born, which is the first in-hospital Geek Squad. And it's one of the coolest <laughs> things. And I can imagine that people in positions of power at a hospital who, who make decisions, whether you're a CEO of a health system, everyone else had to say, I can't believe I didn't think of that. Because it's, it's absolutely brilliant that we have that. Right. And I think one of the things that's always surprising to donors when they walk through our doors is they kind of look at it and think, oh, that's so nice that you have that. Um, but then when you tell them, you know, Best Buy has donated these services and this equipment so that families don't have to deal with technological stress, it like takes it up a level in how amazing they think this is because they think at first they think oh it's a pay for service type yeah. um, thing and it's just like no we are really fortunate to have um, some generosity there and what I love that about it is it really did come out of employees at Best Buy who had this experience at Children's and um, kind of feeling like they could lend their expertise and their workplaces expertise to create something really unique and cool and you know we've seen that along the eight years I've been here I, I always think about United Health Group's uh, mega gift of 17 and a half million dollars to help us become a level one trauma center what an amazing act of generosity um, and what a way to spur our community uh, the children's community to do something that we always wanted to do, but um, do it more quickly and efficiently, and a and really have the 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 funding to do it. And I can imagine it feels overwhelming at times because while we may have goals per campaign, there's really no ceiling to what can be raised. How do you keep yourself from getting overly stressed or overwhelmed when it comes to? okay, yeah, that's great, but it's not good enough, or it could have been better. How, how do you do that? Because I can imagine you might look at a, an area of the hospital that has a need or could improve in some way, 
and you just aren't quite able to get there for whatever reason, how, how do you not pull your hair out? Yeah, no, that's a good question. I think about it a lot by literally every human on this earth could, could potentially be a children's donor. Um, I think we're really lucky to work closely with the hospital's strategic group and make sure that every year the money that we know that we're going to raise is going to go to the priority areas of the hospital. Um, So while we certainly know there's a variety of needs out in the organization and um, with our patients and families, we really rely on that partnership with the hospital to help us decide what are the best projects to be talking to donors about? Where is there the most need? And really going back to my kind of comment about the money that my team and I are raising tends to be the most flexible money because a lot of our donors are saying, hey, we trust you. Put this money where it's needed most. And we call that our urgent needs fund. And it really does make a big difference to have that flexibility because we know there are children's programs that are core to our mission that do not get reimbursed through typical insurance practices. So a really great example of this is our child life program. Those humans do amazing work for kids and families while they're in the hospital, but unfortunately that isn't covered by your typical Blue Cross Blue Shield insurance payment. So the hospital says that's important for kids. That's important for families that we're taking care of them um, psychosocially as well as medically. And so how do we make sure that that program that's core to our mission is there for every kid, every family that walks through our doors? It's the work and um generosity of the community saying, yeah, that's important. I'm going to put my philanthropic dollar there. So yes, lots of opportunities, lots of need, but we're lucky to um, have some strategic direction while also having some flexibility that if an amazing idea comes along and the right amount of funding is there through the donor community, we're usually able to activate pretty quickly. Two things. One, you touched on child life. They they are so vital to what we do. And of the feedback that I see and receive on social media, child life more often than not is involved in some way with a patient's experience. The feedback we get is always, child life was great. And it's nice to see that they're being taken care of because they do play such an important role with our families. I wish we could do more. Um, always for them because I truly believe their work makes my job easier, especially when I'm working with donor families who have had a, an experience here because it's true. Those are people that um, just make that experience of a child in a hospital situation that much easier and even sometimes fun, Yeah, and- which is not what you would always expect in a healthcare setting. Exactly. And if you can, and and actually not child life, but um, the dude in Star Studio, a similar way where if you can be the first memory that a person has and pulls from their hospital experience and child life often is, I think you're doing something right. And think of all of the things. And we say this all the time that usually when people are here, um, if they're not employed like us, they're here because it's a scary time or one of the worst times of their lives and if you can make it as pleasant as possible or even a good experience that's that's saying something about your ability as in this case a child life specialist Um, so that's huge and then the other is if you money's not an object uh, not a problem you could make something happen here that isn't currently happening what would you do a la carte? Hmm. I feel like there's <laughs> so many different things that I would do because <laughs> maybe that's hard. To I just think pick over one. eight years of being here, you you continue to see on a on a really regular basis amazing work that's being done, and and some of it is stuff you you hear about in children's marketing or you know it's some of our bigger signature projects but some of it is is smaller things that um really make you start to think about oh my gosh children's is thinking about um 
that. Uh, I, I always go back to Patsy Stingfield, one of my favorite employees here and who runs our infection prevention program, was telling me about um, a need that her department had to not only make sure that kids were getting their flu shots, but their, their families were as well. And how it was becoming a barrier to families to get the adult flu shots because they had to go somewhere different and parents weren't getting them and that wasn't really helping with the situation. And so um, we worked together with another really generous partner to Children's, which is the Children's Hospital Association or CHA. And we helped set up some funding so that Patsy and her team would be able to do um, certain amount of flu shots for parents. So that's a really small example of something that Children's is doing because they're always thinking about the family. Um, of course, if I had millions and millions, I, I probably would actually look toward investing them in our child and family services programs. I think of the work of Joy Johnson Lind and her team and what they're doing in child life and in social work and bereavement and Star Studio and um, the Welcome Centers and just the volunteer services, everything they're doing there is really creating that space of parents and families, however that's kind of in in a kid's world are so important to the healing journey and how do we make this experience as best as it can be for our patients but also as best as it can be for the the parents or the grandparents or the siblings and um it's such an important part of the children's experience it's something we know our patient families believe so deeply in and Unfortunately, they just don't always have the funding they need. And so I think I would put it uh, toward something like that because it's really amazing work and um, it's what I believe makes children's children's. Yeah, and, and really everyone you mentioned, they're that f- almost that first line of face-to-face interaction that a family encounters even before seeing a doctor or a nurse. It's welcome to ask a yeah. child life. Um, I want to talk about without getting too complex because the foundation is such a large operation and undertaking, but can you give kind of a, a 30,000 foot view? I hate to use that business That's okay. buzz term, but of the foundation and how it, how it works at children's compared to say a standalone found foundation where I'm Joe Smith and I have my own foundation. Sure. Uh, so the Children's Foundation is uh, it, uh, its own separate entity. It's a 501c3. Our mission is to raise money for children's hospitals and clinics of Minnesota. So where some foundations you may find that they are raising money for a variety of nonprofits or they might be um, a family that's created a special fund. We are really um, the the fundraising arm of Children's Hospitals and Clinics of Minnesota. So we are a separate entity. We have a separate board of directors. We have a president of our organization, but we really are tied very closely to this organization, almost sometimes where it's surprising to people how closely and collaboratively we work, but it's great. I mean, I consider myself a member of the Children's of Minnesota employee base and and so does Children's of Minnesota considers me that way. We raise uh, approximately 30 million dollars a year. Um, a lot of that money going toward you know capital projects like our expansion and renovation or new spaces like surgical suites, um, special specialized areas of the hospital. A good chunk of that money, earlier I mentioned that my team and I are raising about $6 million of that, is going toward those program needs throughout the organization, um, like the child and family services area, research, community outreach, those kind of different areas. So we every year we continue to grow our goal of what we're raising and and again partnering really closely with the organization on where those funds will go and how they'll be used best and that's a really strong partnership again with the organization we certainly aren't always saying 
well, this is where we're going to put the money. It's it's really um, a back and forth between the organization, the foundation, and of course, most importantly, the donor, because that's where um, our first priority is to make sure the money is going to the right place. One thing, too, I wanted to make sure we talked about was the way in which a gift comes in and why and it, we're lucky we're fortunate we have a great organization we have a lot of support and we always welcome it but how is it and why is it best that people donate in a certain way because of the volume we do get it and especially come holiday season a lot of people want to have a certain experience or they want to donate something and it, it's great but we just we can't always support certain certain ways of giving Sure. We always see um, that there is, especially around the holiday time, a lot of donors or groups or families who want to raise some money, go out to Target or their local toy shop and buy toys and books and games for kids in the hospital. Because, of course, you it's the holiday time and you think, how terrible would it be to be a child in in the hospital over the holidays. While we love this sentiment, it does become a really, really busy time for us to be physically taking in all that inventory. One of our biggest challenges is actually where do we store all this stuff because um, the generosity of the community is so amazing that we would be giving many, many toys (laughs) Per day out if we were just trying to to move through. So we really encourage our friends and families to think about collecting that money and coming into the hospital to give it as a cash donation. It gives us a lot of flexibility. We can still use it for purposes like um, toys and books and games, but we can spread it out over a longer period of time. What I do want to recognize, though, is that a lot of families or donors say to me, but it's really important that we have an experience when we're giving back these kind of what we what we call in-kind items. And I want people to know that we're always committed to helping them have that experience. We have those big checks that we let families fill out and we take photos. We give Bank people- drive throughs hate those big checks. Bank though. drive throughs are always <laughs> turning me down when I'm trying to cash those and they're like no this isn't gonna work but uh we love those big checks and we love when little tiny kids are holding one because they gave us their birthday money or their lemonade stand earnings uh we try to show people around the hospital so that they can see how their gift will be put into action um And, you know, we recognize that there's always going to be those donors that really believe that they want to give something in kind. And that is certainly okay. We want to accept generosity in all forms. We encourage people to go on our giving website to check out our wish list. This is a list that is curated with our experts in child life. It is a list of items that we see really high need um, that that are educationally or organizationally important. Um, We try to obviously think about kids from baby to teenager. And so if you're a donor who's thinking, I still really want to go out and shop and bring some toys and books and games in into children's thank you so much please check out the wish list see what options there are but if you're open to giving us some flexibility we would love to give you an experience around donating that generous check and we also have an opportunity for those donors who want the experience of shopping but um, don't necessarily want to go out and buy the the things that we need we have something called the giving store on our website This is a really fun part of our website where you can go on and see some of the tangible needs that the organization has on a regular basis. You can make a philanthropic gift related to that. So a really great example is sponsoring a little red wagon, which we use to uh, move our kids around when they're going from inpatient to the playroom. Um... We have things like an hour of 
interpretive services and we've broken down these services so there's kind of a philanthropic value the donor feels like they're giving something with a little more meaning than just maybe writing a check but it's still coming into the organization as that uh, monetary donation and we're able to have a little more flexibility with it so something else for those in-kind donors to think about if they're wondering what else could I do and all that can be found at childrensmn.org slash giving. And then in the giving menu, everything you mentioned is there. The giving store, giving toys and gifts. Uh, it breaks it down nicely if you guys like to scroll through. And, and that, that would lead me to my other question is, so what does somebody who wants to donate, how do they donate? What do they do? Whether they're somebody listening in another state right now, in another country, um, how, how would you go about being a donor? The best way to learn about your options is to visit that childrensmn.org slash giving site. I think we do a really great job of giving you your options. Obviously, we love online donors. These are people that are using our online giving page, which is safe and secure to use a credit card to make a gift to children's. They'll see when they're on there that we ask a few questions about, you know, where do you live? What is your credit card number? And then we give you quite a few options to choose where you might want that gift to go. That is continues to be a really, really popular and easy way and cost-effective way for us to manage those do donations. We certainly accept donations in the mail. We have a lot of people who send us um gifts and sometimes they're in honor of people or in memory of people or celebrating a really special occasion and we absolutely accept gifts uh, checks can be made out to children's foundation or children's hospitals and clinics of minnesota um, we have an address for that it's 2910 center point drive roseville minnesota 55113 that is correct center with an re yes point with an e yeah or as i like to say century pointy <laughs> that's how i remember it that mnemonic device um, we also are out in the community partnering with local businesses so you might walk into um your local white castle and be invited to make a gift there or you may see us at an event nearby and you can certainly make a donation anywhere where we're kind of available and and out in the world and I think we're also very fortunate that we have so many people participating in events, throwing events for us, third-party events, it, to benefit children's. I want to talk about our signature events, but also some of these third-party ones. We were coming off the heels of the uh, annual paintball tournament for the Children's Heart Clinic, right? It's for yep, the Heart Clinic, yep. cardiovascular program. and. Cool. I mean, it's super cool thing. Is it Matt Ames? That's correct. Yeah, children's heart <laughs> patient who runs that every year, and it's it's awesome. How would somebody one go about in establishing a third party event or an event where they say, "I want this fundraising to go toward children's"? Is there a formal process for an event? Yeah, that's a great question. We love, love, love community fundraisers like Matt Ames. Or I was just talking to some colleagues about a really fun one that we have been able to partner with. It's the Minnesota Utility Contractors Association. They do an event called Day of the Dozers. I re yes. Where little uh, kids can get on the big equipment like bulldozers and excavators and uh, with a, just a small admission fee families are invited to come out to that event it's in Elk River and we have just seen so much generosity around that event and what a fun idea and they really put that on themselves um, they and and people like Matt typically give us a call or send us an email we have a really easy to remember email address it's giving at childrensmn.org and um, they say, hey, I have this idea for an event. This is what I want to do. What we typically do is set up some time to chat with them, whether it's by phone or at, in person. We have a little toolkit where we walk them through kind of here's our best advice from doing events ourselves. This is some stuff we've learned along the way. This is some stuff we would advise you to do. And we do ask every community fundraiser to actually 
sign an agreement with us. Uh, it's a pretty basic thing, just kind of establishing that we're going to be in partnership together. And of course, we have a few little rules and regulations, but um, we really want to try to make it as easy as possible for for um, those community fundraisers who are out there raising money for us. You know, and the other the other kind of community fundraiser that's not as public as some of these events is a lot of times we have families who just say, you know, we feel so much gratitude for the experience that we had at Children's and we would like to be able to share that gratitude with our friends and family and our our personal network and do you have a way for us to do that? And we do. We have software that we help um our patient families or those in the community who want to fundraise for us use. They can put photos, videos, stories, and then um, through the magic of the internet, reach out to all their kind of network through email and say, hey, this is something that's important to me. I would love for you to support the work that Children's is doing. And um, those people receiving that email will get a uh, you know easy to use button to make that online gift and get receipted for their gift and it's pretty um, amazing technology. We just had a family celebrate their uh, son's first birthday and through using a, one of these sites raised over twelve thousand dollars for children's and and to me that's a really amazing connection to their community and to children's and it was through just telling their story and asking for support yeah that was and i I think we could say those the rhymer family that is right and uh an incredible story about baby rocco and anytime whether i meet a family or a patient or a former patient who is enthusiastic about helping it it makes me feel good about what I'm doing here absolutely because you realize that it's that support that makes everything we do possible yep and it sounds cheesy but that's exactly what it is (laughs) no it's it's great and to think about the people who have really utilized what you know the services that you're raising money for that they are coming back and saying I gotta help you raise more money is so inspiring to me I mean there's a, a certain point where, you know, I, I'm getting paid to do this work, which is, is certainly lovely. And then I see someone like Lindsay and Eddie who um, have gone through really quite an experience over many, many months from the time that Lindsay was pregnant to Rocco's time in the NICU. And that now they're saying, help, we want to help you do even more. We want to engage our friends and families because this is such an important program to us. And I don't know if you know this, but Lindsay also is running on Team Superstars, which is our endurance running team. Um, She's going to be running the 10-miler at Twin Cities Marathon. And we are so excited to have all these kind of people just saying, yes, I want to help children, and we're giving them opportunities, whether it's running the Twin Cities Marathon, uh, using our online services to reach out to their friends and family or doing a really fun event like Matt Ames paintball event or um, the day of the dozers. There's just so many opportunities and we're just really grateful that we have this group of people that are bringing these ideas to us and we love it. We want to see more of it. So listeners out there, please join us. We're happy to have you. And I was going to say, not only do I know Lindsay's running, but she's my Team Superstars teammate. Yeah, that's right, because Jimmy. You are running. also a Team Superstars runner, and that, and we're so excited about and that. How is your fundraising going? Well, I'll say this. No one should care that I'm running, but they should care that I'm raising money. I am 40% to my goal right now. That's awesome. So if anybody wants to donate, they can... They can donate to my. To You'll my be team. sending out the page, absolutely, to the listening I've, audience. I've made a I've made a habit of every every once in a while on a Friday I'll send out a Facebook message, and I don't I don't post on Facebook a lot. I've moved on from that uh, because I'm not in college anymore. But uh, I'll post an occasional Friday, like, "Hey, thank you to everybody who's helped support," and it drums up a lot of nice donations, yeah. which is sweet because I figure Friday. Payday. Yep, people are feeling good. Yeah, the weekend's ahead. Exactly. You and know, we always I'm say we always say on our team, um, you have to give people the opportunity to give. And I think sometimes people feel like, oh, 
you know, I've had people say to me, oh, your job must be so hard because you have to ask people for money. And I always say, I don't think I'm asking anyone who isn't really ready to do it. Mm -hmm. Um, Most of the people that I'm engaging with are kind of raising their hand. I'm just there to help them find what is the best way for them to give. And I think similarly with what you were talking about, your friends and family and Facebook friends really want to support you because you're doing something amazing running 26.2 miles but also that you're doing it for a higher purpose you're doing it to help kids and um and the place you work so I think it's it's really cool and we're really excited about that program in particular I'm amped about it and I can't mention team superstars without mentioning Brady Gervais yeah who has done an amazing job it, or she, it was her idea. She organized this team, and it continues week after week to get bigger and bigger. Yep. And we had a we had a long run uh, this past Saturday. I heard Mel about it. it was on one of, of the hottest days of it the was, year. <laughs> it was a scorcher, but we we got through it. It was uh, for me. It was seven and a half miles, and nice. we had a blast. That's and great. I'm I'm excited because while physically, my again no one cares, but my my knee has been bothering me for oh, a few months, uh-huh. but. It's nothing because I'm so excited to be running and raising yeah. money for children. It's not if I was just running to run, maybe I wouldn't run. Right. But I'm going to have no problem running because it's for a, a reason much more important than me getting a t-shirt. Oh, well, that's awesome. But, I did but get take a care too, of your so. knee. Yeah, I will. You, okay. I absolutely will. Um, maybe I'll get one of the docs here to look. Yeah, at it. exactly. <laughs> I, I I'm about the size of a little kid, so that works. <laughs> One, and one thing I do want to stress to everybody listening to is just how important every donation is. And during the Q4 giving campaign, we, we were able to see it. And whether it was 5 bucks or 25 bucks, I love that you can feel a sense of almost like not a sense of ownership, in a, but in a way where you're like, I'm contributing to this. I have a piece of this. And you can, it, just like you had mentioned, when people can – specifically direct where their gift goes Mm -hmm. in a way you are you're owning a piece of what we do here absolutely and I 100% agree we absolutely to the core of our mission believe that every gift makes an impact and we see that through the work that we do again with uh in June we hosted youth philanthropy month and you were a big help Jimmy and helping us promote 12 stories online of kids giving back to support children's. And, you know, you look at uh, a kid like John Geegan, one of our uh, hematology and oncology patients who did a lemonade stand and a garage sale of his toys and raised a couple hundred dollars to support children's. And he's a little elementary school kid. And wow, that is so amazing. And what a heart and really inspired a lot of his friends to give back. I think his school donated $4,000 to us. And then you think of some of these families that are, you know, making a $1,000 gift, which is so significant. And they're doing it because they want to add a tribute tile to our tribute and memorial wall so that they can honor an experience that they had at children's and that tribute and memorial wall is always my reminder um if i have a bad day i usually walk by that wall and i'm reminded of the amazing connections that we have in this organization and the the things that happen here and it usually perks me up pretty quickly but really the gifts make such a difference um we're so lucky to be able to say your gift is valued and the impact is so important. And is there anything that we haven't touched on that you'd like to tell parents listening or anybody who's curious about what goes on here? You know, I think one of the things I would think about for parents, and I know this from friends and family who have young children is as you're thinking about your kids and their ideas of generosity and giving back it's it's great to get them involved with an organization that they can relate to and I think a lot of what we see at children's especially around kids helping other kids is um children can relate a lot to what's going on here and um I love that our organization in particular values uh, our our youngest philanthropists for what they do, whether that's 
collecting um, money or giving back toys and books and games. Um, It's such a great way to teach values that we think are important in the world. I think similarly for those grown-ups who are looking for an organization to engage with, there are so many opportunities at Children's, whether it be through one of our events that we're hosting or um, opportunities to be part of one of our volunteer groups or our donor task forces. We are really looking to engage people in the community who are passionate about kids, who care about kids' health, and who believe in generosity. And so I think we're a great place for someone who's looking to be connected to the community to consider reaching out. We'd be happy to meet with you and learn about your interest and see how we can plug you in, certainly um, through a philanthropic contribution, but we also value people's time um, and energy and great ideas as well. And so always looking for those people who want to have those conversations as well. So is the best way to reach that giving email? The giving email is great. We also have a general number that you can call, 651-855-2800. That's our foundation general line, and you can call in. You could certainly ask for me, and um, Shelby, who usually is answering the phone, will definitely help you out. Um, It's a great place to call and ask questions as well, and we are just happy to get to know you and learn what you're interested in, see if we can find a match at Children's in the Foundation. Well, it's been great talking to you. Thank you. And not only for our listeners to be able to find out more about the Foundation and how it works with Children's, but also for me. This this has been informative. Well, that's what I always say. I think when you spend time with you know your colleagues at Children's you're always learning a little bit more and always a little bit more amazed at the cool stuff that's going on in this organization right absolutely and and I find myself saying this to many of the guests I know how sensitive your time is oh so for you to give me an hour I I appreciate it (laughs) it was really fun I appreciate it thank you thank you 